Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rosalind Johnson Smith. I have the honor of being one of the co founders, along with Sharice Harrison Nelson, for the Mardi Gras Indian Hall of Fame. We are about to start a first ever conversation with the elders. I'm going to start out by paying the kind of respect that we are supposed to pay. I'm going to ask Chief Womble to come up. And he's going to announce for you the names and gang affiliations for um, our three guests today. And I'm going to say one will be coming in. He's on his way. We're going to get started. But he's going to announce the names of the people we can expect and who are already here. Chief. Kuchima. Good evening, everybody. Before I announce our participants, I would like to give y'all a little rundown why we're doing this, why it's so important that we reach out to the elders. This list, uh, I just, just jot it down. These are the chiefs that we have just recently lost. Thunder, he just died two days ago. Creole Nation, my chief, Big Chief Shug, Shine Hunter, Larry Bannock, Golden Stars, Big Chief Jake and Big Chief Junior from the White Eagle, and also uh, second chief, Tootie Montana, Big Chief, Yellow Pocahontas, and the second chief, Edward. Big Jack, Red, White, and Blue, Paul Armpre, Golden Blade, Lionel, Black Feather, Gerard, Black Eagle, Rudy, Nightwall Hunter. We just recently lost some real serious people, y'all. And I'm, I'm glad that some of the younger kids are trying to learn how to keep the culture alive, because we need help. And so what we're trying to do tonight is go back into our communities and reach out to the elders, because a lot of y'all don't know these people. These men are mad. This man, 90-something years old, 80-something years old. They've been massive for a long time, and it's time that we reach back and recognize some of our elders, y'all. Thank you, Chief. We're going to start today with questions that are, we have five categories. But the first group of questions are entitled, All About You. I'm going to ask our two chiefs who are here with us right now, uh, Joe Jenkins and Isaac Edwards, to answer some very simple questions, and they have their own mics, um, so that you can know a little bit about who they are. And Joe, we're going to start with you for each question, and then Mr. Ike is going to answer. Okay. So the first question is, where were you born? Use your mic. I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana. Mr. Ike. Mr. Ike. I was born in I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, May 4th, 1923, chair in the hospital. Okay. And our second question is. How old are you today? I'm 86 years old. I was born in 1929. Yeah. I, I'm, I am 91 years old. So have both of you lived in New Orleans for your whole life? I have. Mr. Mike, Have you lived in New Orleans? Yeah, I lived in New Orleans my whole life. I've been living right in New Orleans, yeah. Except? What about Katrina? I left, I left here after Katrina moved to Homer. I'm living in Homer, Louisiana now. I left here and went to Arkansas, and I came back. Thank you. Next question. When did you start masking Indian? When did you start? I started in 1955. Put, the, put your mic up, Mr. Ike. I started Mass in Indian 1932. Okay. And could you please name the gangs with which you have been affiliated? The first gang I was affiliated with was the Seminole Hunters. Okay. At that time, Oliver Crowden was chief, and I was third chief. Any others? Joe, any other gangs? And I masked with the guarding to the flame. Okay. 
Mr. Ike. I've started off Madison with the Creole Wild West of Brother Tillman. We left Brother Tillman where I started Madison with the uh, Golden Blade. I am the co-founder of the White Eagle. Okay. And you're still the White Eagle. Okay. And please tell us what positions you held during your tenure. During the time that I amassed the first year I amassed, I amassed third chief with the Seminole. Okay. The second time I amassed, I amassed second chief with the Guardians of the Flame. Okay, Mr. Ike? Uh, I made, I made fly, uh, flag boy and second chief. All right, now I'm gonna ask both of these gentlemen to tell us a short story. How did you become a Mardi Gras Indian? That is, what got you interested how did you join your first gang? And who was there to guide you along? Well, when I was a youngster, I used to follow them all the time. And I got interested in the things about them, and I wanted to become one of them. So I followed them for a while, some of the chiefs I talked with. And it was a few years later before I decided, well, I'm going to try. And at that time, I was running with a dude who was a lot older than me. He decided he wanted to bring a gang. His name was Oliver Crowden. He brought the Seminole Hunters. And he asked me would I go with him. I said yes. I went with him and I became the third chief of the Seminole Hunters. I ran a while, then I broke off. And I broke off for a while. When I, when I did come back, I came back under Donald Harrison as his third chief, no, his second chief, really. I came under him. And when he passed away, well, I decided to leave it alone. Thank you. Mr. Ike, tell us how you became an Indian. Uh, I used to follow the Indian in, in the morning. They used to pass my house. And it would be hooping and hollering with the pretty uniform on. I'd say, I want to be an Indian. And um, had a Brother Tim had a, a cousin named Leonard Green. So I told Leonard Green, I said, Leonard, let's get in the game with Brother Tilma. And that's how I started really with Brother Tilma. And from that on, I started sewing, making butterflies. I'm a butterfly man. I'm not for my butterfly. Do you remember your first years as an Indian? Can you tell us what that was like, Joe? Well, my first year was when I was more of a, a greenhorn with them, but I learned pretty fast. And the party that I masked with, I didn't come up with him, but I knew him for a long time. And there was things that I learned from him. And I managed to get through it. There was mistakes I made a few, but I managed to get through it. And today, I'm part of this thing in mind and in spirit, and I love it. I'll always love it till the day I leave here. Thank you. Mr. Ike. Well, when I joined, when I joined over there and with, with Brother Tilmer, and the, the person that taught me a lot was Robbie. He's dead and gone now. Robbie taught me a whole lot of things about the Indian. And when we left Brother Tilmer, we went with the goal, we went to, we went with, 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 um, Oh, golden blade. We went with the golden blade, and from the golden blade, we had so many Indians from our neighborhood. So that's when we decided to form the White Eagle. And I learned to sew from Robbie. Robbie taught me how to sew. Now I've been sewing ever since. I am still sewing. Yes, 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 he is. <laughs> And I need to add just a little something right here. I had the honor of interviewing Mr. Ike uh, about a month or so ago. He not only is still sewing, but I wear trifocals and I have trouble threading my needles. He can thread those needles without his eyeglasses. He's got those beads in every room of his house. And he makes some of the most beautiful butterflies you ever want to see. Uh, as a matter of fact, for those of you give me that, Mr. I, who were at the breakfast, this is one of his butterflies that I put on the program. 
It is absolutely gorgeous. If you saw it in person, you'd want to take it. At least I knew I did. But he was watching me. <laughs> Can you think of just one thing that really stands out that uh, is a fond memory of your time masking Indian? J Joe. Well, there's so many things about the Indians that I love. His style, his type of sewing. Each one make a distinction between the type of sewing. Now, my type of sewing was all action patches, warriors, and things like this here. But we were pretty. There was no doubt about it. And one other thing I have to say, no matter how old you are and where you are, that's something you never forget. You always want to be a part of it, whether physically or mentally, mm. you want to be a part of this. I really like to sew, but this particular time I can't sew anymore. But up until I got where I lost my sight, I kept that needle in my hand. Even though I didn't, wasn't able to mask anymore, I kept the needle in my hand. I have a patch now that I started working. I couldn't finish it because I couldn't see. And every time I look at that patch, I think about how I would like to finish that patch. But I know I'll never finish it, but I keep it there to remind me, this is what I love. This was part of me. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Ike. I, I still love, I love the soul. I love costume that they are making now, but we are a little, our costume was mostly different. We didn't have the, 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 the prune like y'all have now. We had twinkie feathers, and we would take them with twinkie feathers and down. We couldn't afford too much bead. What they had was a junkyard, and we used to go there and get those evening gowns and with a razor blade and cut them bees off and make our soup. That's the way we, we come up. Wow. And there's a little place they call Beatman on 333 Cent Charles Street. Then they started selling feathers. And that's what we bought our feathers to do for our costume. All right, and I want to share a quick story also about uh, Mr. Jenkins. For those of you, how many people have watched the HBO series Treme? Anybody watched any of them? Okay, if you have not yet watched, you're gonna wanna see in the last season, one of the last shows, you're gonna see Joseph Jenkins in a memorial scene. And he's there representing the same elder position that he has now. But when we were on the set, the day they were doing the filming, you may work all day long to film a minute of uh, the show. He was giving me sewing lessons. I was talking about how he got his ideas and he was sharing. And I say that especially for the younger generation who look at those of us who are older and you think, you know, we'll move on the side. Well, let me say he was sitting on the side while I was learning and he was teaching. So if you see them sitting on the side, and you're real smart, go take a seat next to them. You might learn something too. I would like to know if you consider your creations to be art. Joe. Yes, I consider my consideration to be art because it's the form that I chose is different. It, it, it shows what I feel and it shows what I see. And there's many things in my patches. I believe in live patches. It shows live scenes. The action patches. Some of them you might would call they violent. But they're not, they're not in a situation where I'm projecting violence. It's just that I love what I see. And what I see is what I saw. Mr. Ike, is yeah. it art? I can make I can sew any patch. If you draw it, I can sew it. I don't care what it is. Anything you draw for me, I can sew it. And you can come to my house anytime and bring me a pattern you want it. I can sew it for you. I am still sewing and always will be sewing. How do you feel about that? Because some people are really 
very disturbed about the use of their images, especially without permission. And then there's others who actually really want to get paid every time their image is shown. And we have disagreements among some of the photographers who feel like you're in public, I can take your picture. And the people who put in hours and hours and dollars and dollars into creating the artwork that we're talking about. So just give us your opinion about you know, this new phenomenon about uh, who should get paid. Should, if you get paid, should I get well, paid? As far as being paid for what an Indian do, let's say I did a piece, and somebody liked that piece. Maybe they wanted to copy that piece. They can copy it. I have nothing to say about that. That's what they chose to do. That's their personal thing, that's they chose to do it. I have nothing to say about that. Mine is mine. I might look at your patch and say, boy, look at here. You got it from me. But that's as far as it'll go. You did it. And so it's yours. Whether, whether I like it or not, that's, that's, not, that's not my problem. That's not, that's not, uh, and I have nothing to say about that. There's many pieces of art that was copied, and it'll always be like that. Somebody may choose my style of uh, sewing, someone may choose his style of sewing. And we look at the patch and say, boy, it looked like a job I would do. Sure, it looked like a job you would do. But did you do it? No, I didn't do it. He did it. Well, he takes the credit for that, even though I did it first. I have nothing to say about what he do. That's what he does. It's just like you go out there and you draw, you see a line out there and you take a picture of that line and draw, the, draw a picture of that line and I come out there and draw a picture too. Sure, I copied it, you copied it. So I, can, I can't say anything about your copy. That's your copy. You did it. Mine, I did mine. At the time I did mine, mine was great. Now yours come on the plate, hey, I have to accept that. Okay. Mr. Ike. Well, I, I think of sewing a patch, I would like to let, if someone wanted my patch, I think they should get it. I could spread it all over. It, it, they know that that's my work. And that's the way I feel about it. I think when my pet should be, or give it, let everybody see it. You're hiding it for yourself. Nobody know you work. Let everybody see it. Okay. Now, what do you feel about the picture taking, though? If I took pictures at your house of some of your beautiful work, how would you feel if I sold the pictures of your work and didn't give you any of the money? Is it okay because I took the picture, even though it's your work? Well, let me explain it to you like this. You go on the street, you see something on the street. I take a picture of it. Another person take a picture of it. Another person take a picture of it. And they decide they want to sell it. I have nothing to say about that. If he, want, if he can sell it, he can sell it. He, he's the one who took the picture, even though I did it. I'm the one who did it. So he decided, well, you didn't capitalize on it, so I'm going to use it and capitalize on it. I have nothing to say about that. But that's what he chose to do. That's his right to do it. I didn't copyright it, so I have nothing to say about it. And this is the way I feel about it. There's many people that I see out here sewing. It has my style of sewing. Maybe my partner's style of sewing here. But I, can't, I cannot say anything about that. That's what they choose, that's the style they choose. They like my style, they like his style. So they decide, well hey, I wonder how I can do this. He may sit around and watch me do it. And decide, well I believe I can do it this way too. And he do it. I have no, I have no fault with that. I have no, uh, nothing to say about that. He did it. All I can say, boy, he did a beautiful job. All right. Mr. Ike. Well, I, 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 I'm kind of skeptical about that. On the other hand, if a person don't have a pattern, then they'll have a right to, to go on and, and sell it for you. If you don't have a pattern on it, mm -hmm. so if you get the pay you want it, get a pattern, 
Nobody could sue it. Nobody could sell it. Do you believe that an Indian gang must come from a line and be a part of it, or is it perfectly okay for somebody to just decide, I want to mask as a Mardi Gras Indian and claim that heritage for myself? How do you now, feel about that, Joe? Well, I feel about that. I have no problem with that. Because this generation decide, well, hey, I want to become an Indian. Nothing wrong with that. As life goes on, there's always going to be changes. I don't care who it may be, where it may be, or what it may be. Change is going to take place. It, it may not, I may not agree with them. I may not agree with them at all. But this is the way life is. It doesn't stop with one person. It doesn't, it doesn't end that way. It start, might start that way, but it don't end that way. I'm glad that the Indians have a, the youngsters come along and want to pick it up and take it. I love that. Don't let it die. Yeah, well, I accept the, 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 the New England that comes up. I respect them, but it's not like it used to be when we were coming up. We... In, in fact, <clears throat> we had a room at Josephine and Magnolia. We taught the other one how to sew. We didn't want you now again, you ragged and isn't pretty. Teach those guys how to sew. And they would make this suit more better. The suits are different now from when I was coming up. We wrote ribbon. A whole lot of ribbon, nice and arable, but that's their choosing. I prefer the ribbon. I think it's narrow and the ribbon, beautiful. But they have changed the prunes, they have changed that, but that's their property. I love it the old way, but I can't change it. The suits now are so much larger than we had nice light suits you could run. You could run and jump and holler and dance. You can't do it with these big suits. You walk maybe 10 blocks, you're tired. We ran all day long. And everybody, you know, a little different. And that's, that's my opinion. I want to take a minute and present to you Mr. Herbert Gettridge. Please join me in welcoming him to the panel. Some of you may recognize Mr. Gettridge because um, he doesn't consider himself famous, but he has been the subject of major documentaries. He's been uh, involved in a number of Katrina-related recovery uh, discussions. And some of you may recognize his story because he was the young man who decided to return to his home in the Lower Ninth Ward when there were no lights, no stores, no gas stations, where he had no walls, no electricity, no water running, because he wanted to fix his house. And he left his wife in uh, another home and came back. And he told me the other day, she wanted to know, why do you think you're, where are you going? What are you doing? Well, he's a master plasterer, and he could fix his own house. So at 82 at the time, he decided he was coming back to the lower nine to fix his house, and he did. <laughs> okay, my name is Herbert Gettridge, Sr. My birthday is August 31st, 1923. My mother had four kids, and I was the oldest one. But I had a bunch of aunts and uncles that I used to marry with. After I got to be about five or six years old, that's all I wanted to do is mask. I had to mask in something. We used to take, me and an uncle of mine, the same age with me, we used to take an oatmeal box. I know everybody in here know what an oatmeal box is. Cut it in half. He'd take one half and I'd take the other half. And we'd make a rim, a cardboard rim, and glue it onto that. That was our axe. This is for a Mardi Gras day now and we would make us up a costume of our own trousers. We'd stick anything we had on that. 
bones, even bones. We'd stick bones on it, all kind of little beads and trinkets, and we followed the engines. That's all I did from the age of about, oh, I'd say five or six years old until I got to be about 17. And when I got to be about 17, they had a bunch of Indians down in the lower ninth ward, in the ninth ward right across Montague Street, and they had a bunch of Indians in the eighth ward. I would like to have mass for either one of those gangs, but at that time, you, if you had mass an Indian, one or two years you had to mass with one feather. And if you didn't have that one feather, you would have to have a band around you. You'd have to mass about two or three years like that before you could come, come an Indian. In Plan of Woods, it was something like the baseball, like you have to go on the farm team before they can become a big league or something like that, you know. And that's what we had to do. But uh, I was affiliated with some Indians. I, I, I was looking at this paper here. Y'all ever heard any of you in here right now, the older people? Wild Squatoonas? You remember the Wild Squatoonas? Well, I didn't see that on here. Wild Squatoonas, the, the crew of Wild West, everybody knows them. I had an uncle that used to mess an Indian. His name was Thomas Lacoste. I had a cousin there, Yalapokahana. Yeah, yeah, Thomas Lacoste and Joe Lacoste used to mess with the Yalapokahunas. I messed with the Yalapokahunas too, but I didn't mess in it. I messed wild man. And uh, I wasn't what you call wild, but uh, I used to perform behind Wild Man Rock. How many of you remember that? I remember that. Wild Man Rock? Rob Man Walk used to go to the French market. I remember Brother Timber. Brother Timber too. Uh, uh, Timber. I messed with both of them with the Yala Pocahontas. Cheyenne and all the rest of them came out late. I used to go to the practices. We used to have a practice over at Marion and Johnson, the eight ward hunters. And everybody that messed an Indian would be down there on every Sunday night <coughs> until Carnival. We want to talk a little bit about your sewing. How do you get your ideas for creating your suits? Who taught you how to sew? I used and to go sit down. Tell I us about to, that. I used to go sit down at night. I'm sorry, you gotta put your mic close. I used to go sit down at night, brother, not brother Tilma, uh, brother Henri. He had an old Indian chief they called Henri. To his dad, it was named Albert Montana. And, uh, Joe Lacoste, all these people would have a bunch of youngsters sending them back and forth to the grocery store. I was one of them. Well, I was allowed to sit in with them while they sew. And I looked at them decorating Indian suits and headboards and stuff like that. That's where I got my ideas from. And for us pushing the needle, mass and an Indian calls for one thing, an overhand stitch. If you can make an overhand stitch, you can make any kind of design you want with that overhand stitch. And you can sew every and anything with that overhand stitch. That's where I learned to sew at. Indian practice, I went to every Indian practice. My mama used to always say, you're going to get away going to the Indian practice yet. Yeah. Say, mama, I ain't doing nothing to get away. All I'm doing is singing. And that's all I was doing. I was learning something from the older men, how to mess an Indian. And that's why I got the idea of Mass and Indian. In 1947, about four or five of us was down in the eighth ward around Marini and Johnson. And we decided that we wasn't gonna follow the Indians. We was gonna bring a gang of our own. And that's what we did. We made up a gang in 1947. This is after World War II now. We made up a gang with 18 Full dress Indians and the big chief, spy boy and wild man. The first year masking like that, one of the old Indians told us, y'all shouldn't, you can have a chief if you want to, but why don't you go get old man Montana, one of them for the first year, let him show you how to go about this thing. And we got Albert Montana. That's Tootie Montana's father. 
I know everybody in here must know Tootie. Or well, we got his dad in 1947. But after we formed the Eight Ward on it, they last about four, five, or six years. And that chief died, Robert Gettridge, a first cousin of mine. And after Robert died, his brother Raymond and Leo, oh, so many of them, they just left the thing go. So that's how the Eight Ward Hunter died out. But as far as Indian, I'd rather do that than to do anything in the line of sporting, anything. I used to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, put an Indian suit on, and I wouldn't get home. <laughs> Sometimes I wouldn't get back home until 6 o'clock the next morning. <laughs> it's Wednesday. That's just how much I like the carnival. So uh, I, I was just sorry when I got through that I couldn't mask no more, but that's the way it is. But I'll say this. Uh, We've got Daryl sitting over here. We got some other, all, where all the Montanas in here? Raise your hands. Come on, Chief, raise your hands. We've got quite a few still in here. But now these are the youngsters, because this is like we're down to the third generation with you. Your people are going to be fourth generation coming up. So we are talking about some serious history, and the people are still here with the tradition and leaders in the tradition. I think that's something important. Uh, before we ask the final question, I did want to, uh, we talked about the future of Mardi Gras Indians. The fact that we've cleared up a couple of things here, questions we have. Obviously, the elders don't see anything wrong with new people just deciding, I'm going to start up here. But as Mr. Gettrich said, you've got to get somebody who knows something about the tradition. They form their group, like some of the other youngsters we see coming up but they went back to Albert, Montana to say, teach us what we need to know. We're not just gonna claim this. And I think if we don't learn anything today, that's one of the lessons we can take from this. How do you wanna be remembered? We talked about people in our history, but how do you wanna be remembered when you're a part of history? Well, I want to remember that <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to remember that I was one of the best spa flag boy they had, and I can sew, and I still sew. I got a piece. I got a piece at my house. Nobody never seen but her, Sherry. You will not see it no more until maybe when I leave here. That's when the world would, everybody here would see it. Beautiful. Yes, it is. It's amazing. And Can't I nobody make it but me. I got it. And nobody will see it until that day. It's a treasure. Okay. And Mr. Jenkins. Well, I have a piece at home that I started. I have a piece at home that I started. I lost my sight and I couldn't finish it. It's there every time I look at it, I think about it. I never kill, it will never be finished because I can't see to finish it. But at times I pull it out and I look at it. And I say to myself, why, I, why can I finish this patch? So, but I notice others coming behind me with their ideas, their philosophy. It's all right, because each generation bring their thing. And I'm not going to knock it. And you're going to knock it at all. The point is, make your thing Wait looking at. Make your thing wait wanting to be. Make your thing want the people look at you and say, man, I'd like to be what he is. And this is the most important thing. Make sure that you love what you do. If you don't love what you do, you can't really do it. You got to love it. Once you love it, that's it. And whether somebody do your style or their style, it's not important. The important thing is, do you want it to still live? Do you want it to be still carried on? The younger generation is going to bring it on. They're going to bring their thing. It's their time. My time has come and gone. So I have to live with that. And when I see them, I say, boy, if he's pretty, I say he's pretty. Whether it's my style or whether it's whatever style it is. If it's pretty, it's pretty. I can't take that away. The older style, 
put it this way, they masked Indians, but the ones come behind them with their style was way beautiful. I had cousins and things that masked Indians. But when I look at the style of what they'd had then and what these Indians have now, these Indians stand out. And I got to live with that. They might not do the things we did, but they're keeping it going. And that's the most important thing, keeping it going. Don't stop, keep it going. And this is what I appreciate. And finally, Mr. Getridge, how would you like to be remembered in history? Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, it's, I don't know how to put it, but I, I was in a group on a Mardi Gras day at Esplanade in Cleveland. And people tell today, a few people that still live in, tell me, boy, if it don't be for you, it would have been a massacre on that corner that day. We had a spy boy they called Charlie Brown. You might remember Charlie. Mass with the yellow poker hunter. Boy spy boy. Boy spy hit the corner boys. And we had straight through traffic going over, going through Claiborne Street. Well, the light did change, but the Indian didn't stop for the red light at that time. We, and they had a policeman on the corner. This policeman went to whooping and hollering at Charlie Brown because he had us going across that traffic. Just the least bit more, it would have been like it was way back in the game. Those people would beat us in the head or catch one Indian by itself, beat him and throw him behind the bars, okay? But that particular day, everybody was set and ready to go if they would have pulled with Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown told a man these words, he said, Mr. Policeman, this is Mardi Gras Day, and this is our day. He said, we hit this red light, this corner voice. Your traffic got to wait now. <laughs> and I was fighting words for the police. They were ready to jump on us then. But guess what? We must have had 25 or 26 full just Indians and two or 3,000 second liners. The police wasn't the one nothing that day. But uh, I stepped up and I told Charlie Brown, he was much older than me. I wasn't more than about 16 or 17. Charlie Brown must have been about 26 or 27. I told him, Charlie, too many people gonna get away if you make a humbug. Don't crowd them. After the few more pass, two or three of them, we'll stop our crew and let that traffic go through. And I'd like for some of those people, if they still, living that remember that incident, I would like them to pass it on to some other body. Wonderful. Mr. Ike, before we close out, it's a very interesting story and I would like for you to share it because we're going to post this. Would you tell us the story of Heiko Aiko? Put the mic to your mouth. Aiko, Aiko. Put the mic up. Aiko Aiko. When we were at <clears throat> we the mass in the White Eagle, and it was singing. And for, the first song that I could remember that was made by the White Eagle was uh, Shallow Water Mama by Bernard Lomax. And had another guy in there that was singing later on. And he looked at me, and he said, Aiko, 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 not there, and it's Aiko. I am Aiko. Aiko. It was originally Aiko, and would tell the whole story, but it was Aiko and how it came about. It means that at first he was singing Aiko, right? Yeah, 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 before he, and then it came Aiko, Aiko, it was me. So he has said all the while, as long as I have known him, that he is the inspiration of how Aiko which was the traditional uh, chant, became Aiko. So he is, his story is that he is the inspiration for that. And Joe, you said something when we were going through Story Circle for the um, play Pretty Ugly Before Pretty Pretty, and that has resonated and stayed in my soul and in my heart. You were telling the young people that 
often they say that the Indians are uh, violent, they get into humbugs and confrontations on Mardi Gras Day, and that that is not correct. You said the reason why people get in humbugs, uh, can you tell the rest of that story? That it's not just Indians, it's something that happens on Mardi Gras Day? It's always been a situation where the Indians get charged for things that doesn't really happen. Because I don't know why it's like that, but it has always been that way. And we have to live with that. Not that it's true, because it's not true. All of the Indians, they, they face problems. Everybody face problems but they dealt with it. And some of the times it, it was kind of bad, some other times it came out pretty good. But that's life, all that makes up life. And when you can't accept that, then you have a problem. Because you can't make life the way you want it. You have to accept life the way it is. Now you can change it from your actions, but you cannot Reject it, because it's going to be there. Whether you like it or whether you dislike it, you have to learn to live with it, you have to learn to accept it, and you have to learn how to change it. Until you can do these things, there's nothing you can do but sit back and look. One last story. I can tell you about an incident that happened. I was in a tribe one day. This wasn't an eight horde hunters. It was a tribe from the ninth horde there. I can't think of the name of those boys now because I only mess with them once. But we were going out St. Bernard Street, coming towards St. Claude. The Indians hit the corner first, and when they went to make that turn on Rampart Street to go straight up Rampart Street, there was a truck park right there. And that truck had a pile of oh, a bunch of cowboys. They had their cowboy suits on. They had walking sticks. What they didn't have, I wouldn't even tell you. But nevertheless, when the Indians start passing by that truck, one of those fellas reached out the truck and grabbed his crown and just snatched it. So you can know by that, if you touch a crown, you was in trouble. And uh, that particular day, all hell broke loose. The Indians, the second line, and everybody else was on top of that truck. And when they finished beating them people up on that truck, them cowboys, the police moved about a million. They had a million police come around. All right, they took a few people to jail, but they couldn't put all them people in jail. And any time we try to tell them the story, he grab you, he get over there too. He gonna take you to jail because you're trying to tell him what happened on a modern ground day. I'll never forget that the longest day I live. If I'm not mistaken, I am not, I'm not calling no names. But I know one, one fellow that got some time in penitentiary for what we did on that truck, but uh, it just had to be done. They were taking advantage of us for what reason, we don't know. And we never would find it out. And that's real history, ladies and gentlemen. We have had the pleasure and honor of sitting here for the past hour or so to glean information from just almost 300 years of Mardi Gras Indian experience with these gentlemen. Please join me in giving a rousing round of applause for our history. Thank you, Mr. Edwards, Mr. Joseph, Mr. Getrich. <laughs>